turn to you. So unfortunately we experienced some tech difficulties that's one of the things about being alive and in the bush but our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me hopefully we'll be back with you shortly Sorry about this everybody, perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around madly trying to fix it and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Welcome back, welcome back. It looks like we got these little gremlins that creep into the beginning of the show, but you know, no doubt Alex and Peter and all of the wizards that we've got working on them have somehow done some magic again and we can come to you again. I'm Steph Winterboer. On the back of the camera today, we've got Gerrit and we are at Juma Primary Game Reserve here in the Kruger National Park, right down in South Africa, right on the eastern coast. We're about 100 miles away from the sea right now where we are. And if you put your finger down in about the middle of the Kruger National Park on your map where you are, right near the middle, that's where we are, around about, if you want to go and do that exercise. Um, we've come into this area today mainly because the wind is blowing in our face so that I don't have to drive in my own dust. And two is I like these little drainage lines that we're driving next to. They have, they afford us a nice opportunity to get some of the animals that have been hiding out from the sun looking for the last little bit of vegetation that's, that's holding on to these drainage lines where the water is, the last little bit of water that is here, is here. And maybe we get to see something. We're heading towards Bivelsook Dam. The reason being is that that is where we saw the lions last. That's where the cubs are at the moment. We know that there are lions in the area. We unfortunately couldn't find them this morning. There were just too few of us driving around in Juma. It was literally just myself and Jamie on the property this morning. And that's too few people to look at all the different nooks and crannies that we got. So I'm holding thumbs that tonight's going to be a bumper show, although that's me predicting something again, you know. That's always a dangerous thing. And don't forget, you can send us questions. Send your comments as well. You don't necessarily have to think about a question. You can just make a comment on something that's good for you, not so good for you. Suggest something that we can talk about. Your choice. You can send them through via email on at questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the Twitter handle, the hashtag Safari Live and uh, we can communicate that way. Alright, off we go. As you'll notice, Wendy is working again. We have clutch, <laughs> we have even second gear which is a novelty. So, good girl. And on that note, we're going to send you off to Jamie who wants to say hello.
wonderful news about Wounded Wendy. She seems to be back up and running. But good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Dave on camera with me. And together with Steph and Gert we will be looking for all kinds of amazing things to show you. But before we go dive right into that, just a message from the team in Rwanda from Graham, Emily and Brent. They had an amazing time and they of course got plenty of footage and an incredible encounter. Unfortunately, as you may have guessed, our live streaming didn't work. We couldn't receive their signal. But all is well there. They are happy and very content, I think, with that incredible moment that they got to share with the gorillas of Rwanda. So just a little message from them there. Right, the other reason that I'm parked off the road here, on, or just off Gallego shortcut, is to show you this Nyala carcass. Now, um, for those of you who are sensitive to blood and gore and so on, there's not much of that left. It's just bones and skin at the moment. But I do want to just chat a little bit about this because I think it's one of those really, really rare moments where before any of the other scavengers got to get here and feed off it, including our hyena and our leopards of the area, or lions, because the lion is a very, very serious scavenger, this carcass has been entirely fed upon by vultures from start to finish and I'm gonna just drive us a little bit closer so I can show you why so for those of you who are a bit feeling a bit squeamish please take a moment to sort of maybe perhaps just look away from your screens and I'll tell you when I'm finished but there's not much there's not really much left of it right so normally obviously I wouldn't be fiddling with a carcass but I happen to know how this one died. It was killed during a fight with another male right outside our camp. And the guys moved it here because obviously we don't want it right next to the camp itself. I'm just going to hop out. That's why I know I can fiddle with it. Obviously in dry times like this you definitely don't want to run the risk of any exposure to anthrax in unexplained animal deaths. But what's interesting about him in this area is that of all of his rib bones, everything here, his entire skeleton is completely intact. I don't actually want to touch him completely, but there's no bones have been chewed upon. So everything is completely intact. If a leopard or a lion or a hyena had come and fed on this carcass, nothing would be intact. These rib bones would be chewed off, the vertebra of the spine would be chewed off, and you certainly wouldn't have the intact hip joints and leg joints that we've got here. So this was entirely the work of vultures that they came through and they fed off this carcass. Isn't that period that they pretty much ate this entire animal? It doesn't even smell yet. It still smells freshly dead. The others, his nose would definitely have been chewed. But he does provide us with a sort of a fascinating glimpse into the way that an animal's anatomy works. Complete with, this leg is sort of attached. Can you get into this hoof, Darby? Awesome. Complete with his, the two halves of his hoof, which is a really nice opportunity to memorize the shape of the hoof itself. If you remember what the tracks look like. And then, if we look here, you can even see the evolutionary residual hooves. Well, not hooves, the re residual digits, actually, that all hoofed animals have, but it's much less prominent in things like Nyala and Kudu. They're very, very interesting. Not a thing has been nibbled upon, apart from the fact that the entire carcass is gone. And it just goes to show how delicately vultures can go about eating something. That being said, they have managed to completely dislocate one leg. So they've managed to pull that away from the carcass completely. And I've done a check around here. There's not a single track of any other scavengers, any other scavenger other than vultures. Now, interestingly enough, this provided a meal for the vultures of the low felt and probably attracted several. There was one hooded vulture when we arrived back here. Actually, there were three hooded vultures and one white-backed, and they've all vanished. They've all disappeared off. So that, that carcass is pretty much eaten from start to finish by vultures alone. Last cool thing 
about this particular area is this. Let me put my pop my earpiece back in in case final control desperately need to get hold of me. But let me show you this vulture feather. I really like it because I think its shape is absolutely amazing. It must have come from maybe the tail, possibly one of the flight feathers, but its short stumpy shape is what amazes me. It's fascinating and incredibly strong, the fringes of this wing. Now X-Ranger, you were wondering about how long it would have taken them to eat all of that meat. Well, we know exactly how long it was because this, this animal died last night. Um, and vultures only get up early, get sort of rising up into the air when the thermals start to attract them, or just the thermals start to heat up enough for them to fly. At what would it be? Probably around 8 this morning. So that's been finished from 8 o'clock this morning until now. Incredible to think that that's how fast these creatures move. And I really, li I think this feather's fascinating. I think I'm going to keep that. A bit dirty though. I'll pop it over there. Vultures are not, they're not what we would call hygienic animals. They do go and wash themselves, but still, when you think about their, I hesitate to use the fra phrase lifestyle, but when you think about their lifestyle, it makes one a bit sort of, ugh. Lots of eating rotten carcasses. Okay. In that case, let us wend our merry way out of here and see what else we can find you. How did I get in here? Oh, that way. I often speak about the fact that one thing you learn to do very well as a guide is reverse. There we go. Spend a lot of time going backwards. Oop. I have more good news for you actually, just on the subject of updates. Herbert is back, <laughs> which means we've got an additional set of eyes to help us find things. Plus of course Herbert has demonstrated that he is an absolute tracking legend. Herbert, for new viewers, is our tracker. He works, he, he is a guide, he's a qualified guide as well, so he does occasionally guide guests from the lodges, but he, for now, is helping us out in finding things. And he's taught us some of the most amazing little snippets of information that I have ever heard. Okay, where to now? It's a hot day, it's an unusually hot day, it's even hotter than yesterday. I think we're going to cruise along to Sydney's Dam and see if there's herds of elephants piling up there to go and drink. And while we go and check Sydney's Dam, let's go back across to Steph and find out what his plan is for the afternoon. Welcome back. And um, yeah, Jamie's on her way to Sydney's Dam. We're about to approach Buffalo's Hook Dam actually. And although I've seen lots of tracks of elephant moving away from the dam, one bull in particular had dustbin lid sized tracks. So it was quite nice to see. I'm hoping to see something else here. Now, I don't quite know what we're going to find over here. It could be anything, it could be nothing. But it's always exciting. There's always this excitement that happens when you approach a dam. I don't know why. I don't know what makes it different from coming around a corner. But for me, there's just this anticipation that sort of builds. Oh, these flies. I actually caught that one. Did you see? <laughs> Then let it go. Ah, we have buffalo and hippo and zebra, many. So that hippo is not going to tolerate those buffalo close to him. I probably think that he's going to try and intimidate those buffalo. A bull hippo, probably not a, a full grown bull hippo. And bull buffalo, definitely full grown bull buffalo. Look what he's gonna do. Where are you going? <laughs> you see how everyone gives gives him some space? What is happening here? I couldn't tell you. The only thing that I could possibly guess at is he's trying to chase the zebra away or 
he's already thinking about moving to go and feed for the evening and the afternoon and he might have to walk that far to find grazing grass and with the temperature expected to plummet over the next couple of minutes you know the next hour to 45 minutes or he could be getting too hot and is moving into the shade hippo can actually get sunburned believe it or not and they have the most amazing secretion in their skin it's called hippo sudoric acid and it's a sticky gel it's like a sticky sweat that they get covering their skin that dries and actually absorbs ultraviolet UV light can you believe it they've got a UV a sunscreen sweat that is this reddish color or pinkish color and he's actually right he's actually leaving can you believe it he didn't just come out to chase the buffalo he's actually going <laughs> <laughs> oh, these animals. We had the absolute pleasure today of sharing most of our between game drive time with a scientist from a local government department that is busy studying animals in these wilderness areas. And what an amazing man to sit and chat with. And he said 80% of what animals do is within boundaries, and then 20%. We don't know what they're doing, and that is considered normal. 80% of whatever the books say and whatever you can see, and then 20% of who knows what's going on. And that from a scientist. <laughs> what's happening here, though, is pretty easy to, to, to suggest at. During the heat of the day, these buffalo come down to the water, and they lie in the mud and the sand and the, and the, and the, and the, and the water and cool themselves down. Coating their skins in mud, which protects them from the burning sun and also sticks to ticks and allows the mud to slough off, carrying the parasites with them. And they do tend to be quite, I don't know, I wouldn't call them social things, Buffalo. I mean, to start with... When you have 60,000 ticks living on your body and probably close to the same amount of flies buzzing around your face, it makes for, yeah, you're not, a, you're not a friendly character by the end of the day. Let me just put it to you that way. It can be quite cantankerous. I just love these buffalo bulls. The Kruger National Park a couple of years ago decided that they were going to close down their artificial watering points that were dotted around the park and embarked on a multi-year, I think it took them probably 10 years, maybe even a little bit longer, to systematically close and break down these artificial water points. And it had the effect, well the Sabi Sands having a lot of water, had the effect of drawing out these buffalo from the Kruger National Park in the dry times. And I've seen just in my short time here since that has happened in the last three to five years an absolute massive increase in buffalo bulls in the Sabi Sands. This year I haven't seen as many buffalo walking around here as I've ever seen in my life in any other place. Michael's asked the interesting question, not just, I'm sure Michael, it was spawned by because you watch this hippo climb out of the water and you're seeing the drying up of the pan. But you asked, where do the hippos go when the water dries up? Now, Michael, they can walk quite far. It's not uncommon for a hippo to walk up to 60 kilometers to the next fresh water. But in the Sabi Sands, there's a lot of pumped water. He, I don't think he's going to run out of water. That's not his immediate problem. His immediate problem is running out of grass to eat and he's going to have to walk increasingly far distances to find new grazing areas and I think rather than run out of water by the end of the dry season there's a real chance these hippos start to start to starve to death as the grass runs out within a day's walk of of any water source and they have to have water they don't have to stay in water all day, but they are very prone to dehydration. They can actually die from, from dehydration and heat exhaustion. 
And although they can spend some time in the shade, they, they are tied to water. And our first rains are really, our first... Oh, sorry, I'm just being told that my arms keep on coming into, into frame as I frantically try and swat my face with a multitude of flies that uh, plague me. I don't know what it is. I think it's my bald, shiny head is a beacon to them from far and wide. And even now, I have like 15 flies buzzing around my face. Courtesy of the buffalo that you're seeing over there, as they enter the water, the flies leave and then obviously come and sit on anything that moves close to them. I think my head resembles the top of a buffalo's boss. Maybe they think I'm a buffalo. <laughs> quite a peaceful setting, this, I must be honest with you. I quite like Bufflezook Dam. It's one of the very few dams in the Sabi Sands that doesn't have an, a lodge attached to it, and so you don't have the usual noises and utterances that is associated to a lodge. There's no one hammering with a hammer or sawing with a saw or shouting or doing something. It's a very, very peaceful place, this. All right. Jamie has a kudu that she wants to show you. And these buffalo aren't going to go anywhere, so that kudu might just see you in a bit. I've entered into a steering competition with my kudu that has now decided that, as, as is often the case with our live safaris, that it doesn't want to be on camera. As we promise you something, it's gone. But that's okay, I'm going to try and reposition to get you another view of this beautiful animal. <laughs> oh, there's one. About to disappear as well. It's our sandy patch herd of kudu. You sort of get to know the different kudu of the area and they do tend to move in relatively small areas or they seem to over the last few months. This is the sandy patch herd. Um, hmm. They're not making life very easy, are they, Dave? No. <laughs> if I go any further forward, I'm going to scare her, which I don't want to do. And she's going to move away further into the vegetation. So an animal that always feels more comfortable in dense vegetation. Rather than being out in the open. So you'll always find that they have a greater sense of confidence when they're tucked away behind some trees. Oh. <laughs> and as always with kudu, the more you look, the more you see. Including the one that's been standing right out in the open on my right. The entire time. Just goes to show, if you spend too much time looking on one side, you might miss what's on the other. And Abhishek, we always see the lovely lady kudu together, but you're wondering would the mature bulls make their own herd? And yes, they do. They do often go around in bachelor groups. Um, unless, of course, there's a lady in estrus ready to mate, at which point they become a bit more antisocial. But unless they are competing for the right to pass on their genetics, they absolutely will form little groups all on their own. And we used to, around this area, they've sort of split up now, but around this area we did get a group of five huge male kudu. They were absolutely stunning. We did occasionally see them, one of whom was a kudu that was being nicknamed Zeus by the viewers, I think, because he had absolutely enormous and very unusually wide-spaced horns. So kudu are interesting animals, because although you'll find them in herds like this, there's not a set formation or pattern to it. So the impala have their breeding herds throughout the year, and then it's only during the rut that things get shaken up a bit. In kudu, they come together, they move apart, Move from one group, some groups split off into different smaller groups and then join up with other different smaller groups. There's no set pattern to the way in which kudu move. But as with anything, safety in numbers trumps pretty much any other approach. So there you go. The back of her feet as she walks away, we've just examined the dead nyana, which is the cousin 
of the kudu. And you can see a serious, I mean, we didn't sit to examine that. It was a bit macabre. We didn't, I love looking at those carcasses, though, because they are absolutely fascinating. But you can really see the similarity in the body shape, especially around the legs. And they've also got those dark tufts of fur, even more pronounced in the kudu, at the base of their hooves. And you can just see the little false hooves at the top. As she wanders away from us. Our kudu are the most amazing jumpers. I've seen a kudu clear a six-foot fence without even thinking about it. In other words, she didn't run up or have any kind of momentum behind her. One minute she was one side of the fence, the next she was other, on the other. They, it's like they're flying. Their jumps are absolutely incredible. If you ever get an opportunity to witness them, you'll understand exactly what I mean. They really do have this supreme jumping ability. Elant as well. Now, an Elant is the largest member of the antelope family and also the largest cousin of the kudu, of the Trafalagus family. And Elant do it as well. For an animal that is basically weighs the same amount as a buffalo, to see it clearing those sorts of heights and distances is mind-boggling when you do see it. And Michael has been incredibly observant about our kudu. Michael, you've been watching really closely. Yes, you are 100% correct. Each and every set of stripes on each and every kudu is unique to them. And if we wanted to, not, no, it's not really about if we wanted to, if we spent as much time, if we could spend as much time with them as we do with some of the cat characters or the other animals, we would be able to identify them just as well. And funnily enough, last year when there were a couple of really pregnant females, I followed them around for a bit and I did learn to identify the individual kudu by their stripes. There's one little kudu calf, hopefully still around, around Pangolin Track that has a backwards facing J on her shoulder. There's others with very strange splits in their stripes. Uh, one of the viewers, Teresa, actually told me quite a while ago a beautiful story about the kudu stripes and here comes one with a very very distinctive pattern on her side you can see how that stripe pattern splits into three here you go look closely at that that will always be will always be able to identify her by that it almost looks as though I always feel as though it, it looks on kudu like somebody poured wet paint along the ridge of their back and it's just the dribbles that have run down their sides and then dried that way. But as I said, Teresa actually fed me this beautiful in piece of information about how the local legend goes that Kudu and Inyala and Bushbuck, their legs were too skinny for them to be able to support their body weight. And the, the creator had to reach down and lift them up. And in doing so, wherever the creator's hands touched on the Kudu or the Inyala or the Bushbuck, it left behind these beautiful white stripes. Now obviously they serve a form in terms of breaking up the animal's outline, but that is a really be I think that's a beautiful story, especially on Inyala, where you can almost imagine the fingerprints on the white dots. Okay, and that I think spells the end of our kudu sighting. I don't think there are any more left. But very observant, Michael, and the same will apply for anything, Inyala. Giraffe have unique spot patterns, um, bushbuck have unique spot patterns. Everything out here is actually identifiable in some way. It's just the amount of time that you invest in looking at them. And Maurizia, while we, Maurizia, while we go up to our kudu here and I heard your keychain with me actually the other day I must it's somewhere it's in my box now I think I was telling Gert about it but Mauricio was wondering about what species go from grazing to browsing in the dry months 
and the answer is all of them to an extent. Um, the mixed feeders, like the impala, spend most of their time feeding off the trees. The other day we encountered some buffalo that were very determinedly browsing. Now you do, even in the summer months, you might see a buffalo take a bite of a leaf at some point or another, but to see them as actively feeding as they were, and if my memory serves, it was off a weeping wattle that they were munching on. So they will. I've seen zebra do it, but very, very reluctantly. But again, as we've always said, <laughs> animals in textbooks. I've also seen giraffe eating grass. I, I promise you, I saw it bend down and eat several mouthfuls of grass, which you will not read in any book. Well, maybe you will. I, I can't claim to have read every book on giraffe. But I did find that fascinating. Okay, Kudu, can I come past, please? And as I go slowly past our kudu so that we don't scare them in any way, Paul, yes, the kudu might go. You're a big girl. You're a very big girl. Beautiful big girl. Shame. There's hardly even any leaves for her to eat. She's busy munching on a branch. Sorry, Paul. I'll get you in one moment. She seems to be quite relaxed. Hello, gorgeous. With your big radar dish ears. And Paul wants to know if the kudu will start to range into Kruger as the dry season continues in search of nutrients. They will absolutely. All animals are going to have to move further and further afield. Hello, beautiful. I can actually hear her ankles clicking, which Ilan to do as well. Interesting. I don't think he would have been able to hear that, but I could. That's so interesting. I didn't realize that. Huh. The other one didn't do it. Sorry, what I mean by that is Elant, wherever they walk, they're accompanied by the clicking sound of their metatarsal bones clicking and the two halves of their hooves clicking together as a result. I've never heard Kudu do it, though, before, and hers definitely did. I didn't realize quite how easy that was to hear. So yes, Paul, um, our animals will try and roam further afield. There's only, the thing is, there's only so far that they would go. Because if we could tell the kudu that if they went further to the north into Kruger, they would find food, we would. But they don't know that and they don't tend to range that far afield. And of course, between them and that part of Kruger is this huge, vast space part of the middle part, the sort of central and southern part of Kruger. And let me tell you something, this place, the Sabi Sands is quite bad, and the northern Sabi Sands is quite bad. That part of Kruger is worse. It's got less water. There's actually a bull in here that I didn't spot. I'll go forward a little bit to try and show you. That part of Kruger's got even less food. It's got more animal traffic, and it has absolutely no water. Oh, he's massive. Oh, try and get a view. I think if I put you back a little bit, Dave. Mm, sort of. I think that might be it. I think that's as good as it's going to get. You'll have to take my word for it when I say he's massive. He's got very wide spaced horns, but I don't think it's the, the kudu I was talking about earlier. That would be incredible. Speak of Zeus and then he appears. Hard to tell, but you can just see the tips of his enormous spiraling horns. And you only have to take one look at those to see that they are for reproductive purposes rather than defense. And the reason I say that is because they're ostentatious and quite thoroughly impractical. And that immediately, kind of like the bright coloring of something like a bird, for example, that immediately tells you that that's... Ad that adaption is for repro as a reproductive strategy for attracting mates rather than for survival. Because those horns are only going to get stuck in trees and so on. 
Now, in terms of aging a kudu, it is very tricky with the females. It is slightly easier with the males. They start to, at about four years old, get the sort of two twirls to their horns that will go right up to three as they get older. So, Michelle, that was your question. I don't know the exact time frame in terms of horn growth on kudu. I can obviously tell you that their horns grow throughout their lives and gain those twirls, and it's around six that they will have the full three twirls. <clears throat> so that gives you a rough indication. But for females and for younger kudu, it is very, very tricky to age them exactly without having a look at the growth of the horns up close as well as the condition of their teeth. We often talk about the teeth process in terms of aging them. And that's one very, very good way for predators and for antelope as well, for getting a bit of a grasp as to their age. And as we leave our lovely kudu and go off in search of other things, let us find how st uh, find out. <laughs> let us find out how Steph is doing on Wendy. Blur. Welcome back. We've just gone to go and check the den site of the cubs and there's no sign of anything there. No sign of any footprints, no sign of any cubs, no sign of any mom. Just an empty den site for all apparent purposes. There have been a lot of elephant tracks through the area. So between when we were here this morning and now, a herd of elephant has moved into the area and I have no doubt that the mother the mother lion will not risk drawing attention to her babies by coming into the middle of a pride of, or the middle of a herd of elephants at least anyway. There's a good chance that she's come, heard the elephants, and then moved off somewhere. Still, I'm still wanting to say that my gut feel is telling me that these lions are lying on a kill somewhere. That's what I think. I don't know where. I mean, basically what we've done is we've crisscrossed this area this morning and I know that they haven't left this area. I haven't found any footprints of them, of them outside of this local area. And none of the guides in the neighboring properties have called in any footprints of lions either. So my gut feel is telling me that they're lying here somewhere. They're probably on a kill of some sort inside here somewhere. But the only way we're going to find that is, A, if we find a decent set of tracks to, to track into, or we see some vulture or raptor activity of some sort. So vultures, having spent the day now flying around, hopefully would have seen this kill and would be able to help us locate it by landing in the trees. But until we see something like that, the, the longer, it's almost like a case that goes cold. The longer these tracks have to weather in the, in the wind, and the less chance there is of us finding them until they've obviously finished the kill and they move off. But anyway. <laughs> Abdir Rafi, you're a new viewer and I just want to say welcome to the show and you <laughs> you've just asked the question, what are you watching? Well, it's quite easy, Abdir. You're on probably the largest safari vehicle on the planet, and we are on safari now at the same time that you're sitting watching the show, wherever you're sitting it to. A couple of seconds after the picture goes from me into this glass and out of your screen is what you're seeing. It's live and it's interactive, as you've just seen. You've just asked the question, and I've just managed to answer it for you. We're on safari in the Kruger National Park in South Africa. We're on the eastern side of South Africa. We're in a privately owned game reserve called the Sabi Sand Viltain. And we are on a portion of that called Juma. That's where we operate from. A couple of thousand hectares in extent. And it's big five area. It's dangerous game area. It's, it's an open system. Now what that means is that animals have a very, very wide space to roam in. We're looking at about three and a half million hectares, probably close on about Ooh. I don't even know what the conversion is. Would you welcome to do that conversion? Three and a half million hectares converted into the unit that you use where you're sitting. That'll give you an extent 
of how big this area is that these animals are open to roam into. Now what we're doing is we're tracking down some lion. Last night there were four female lionesses right here where we are now. One of the lionesses has got some babies, tiny little furballs this big. And so she will be going from her sisters where they hunted to last night and through the day. She'll be moving through this area to go from her sisters to her cubs, from her cubs back to her sisters. And her, she's going to her sisters because that's where she gets her food from. Although lions can hunt on their own perfectly well, they operate much better in a group, in a cohesive whole. And that's what we're looking for at the moment, oh dear. I'm scanning through the bush using my not so phenomenal eyesight to try and pick up anomalies in the bush and hopefully identify them into something for you. And we're also looking for tracks on the ground where we can track animals by using the signs of their passage and hopefully decide whether it's fresh enough to follow or not and terminate that little investigation at an animal for you. Helen, all the way from New York City. Hello, Helen. It's uh, morning for you there at the moment. You just asked me, why am I not wearing a hat? And it was interesting that you've asked me that, Helen. Gerrit just asked me that exact same question. Um, quite simply, I have a hat. Here's my hat. I just don't have it on when I'm speaking to you all. And for the, for the funny reason, it's, it's, uh, it's silly, but a, a hat creates a shadow over my face. And I feel, at least anyway, that it sort of breaks the contact that I have with you. I like to be able to look into the lens and believe that you are looking straight back at me and we have a bit of a connection through this lens. And a hat, I feel, similar to sunglasses, breaks that. I know it sounds a bit finicky and a bit silly, but that's basically what it is. So I will try and wear a hat as much as I can. I, um, I also do put on sunscreen. I haven't put on any today. Mainly because yesterday and today were the first really warm days of this dry season. But I'll start putting on some sun cream from today, or from tomorrow at least anyway. Keep this shiny, bald head of mine safe. <laughs> Thanks for your concern. Alright, now we're heading back up to Cheetah Cut Line. I didn't go all the way down Cheetah Cut Line today. We got sidetracked by Karula's tracks. Now Karula, for all you first time viewers, is a dominant female leopard that lives in this area. And female leopards are highly territorial, which means that there'll only be one full-grown mature female leopard in this area. And her tracks, her fresh tracks from this morning, are walking on this road that we're coming to. She did cross out of the area where we can drive, but that with this particular cat means very little. She is absolutely prone to walking during the middle of the day. Contrary to how we believe cats usually are, our general belief is that cats sleep most of the day because it's quite hot and they try and conserve energy. But in this particular cat's uh, case, she's also got two youngsters and she's also needing to move from, well, she hunts basically, patrolling her area, going back to her cubs, making sure they're okay, carrying on patrolling her area. And I've now come back out onto the road she was walking on this morning to see if she's come out of the bush. She walked into the bush on our left-hand side, the left-hand side of the road that you can see. She was in here this morning. I'm wondering if she's come back. I have a wonderful memory of Karula on this road, almost in this exact spot in actual fact. Myself and a guide called Scott Dyson, a previous guide and great friend of mine. We came down this road tracking one day and in the distance we saw, I caught that fly as well and then I didn't kill it. I had two in one game drive. Um, we were coming down this road and saw this funny track in the road in front of us. And I distinctly remember Scott going, I don't know what that is. And we drove up to it. It was right here roundabout, And he pulled off the road like this, just like this. 
And that mark was at the bonnet of the car. And Scott opened the door and I jumped off the tracker seat. And when we bent down to have a look at what the track was, Karula was lying right here. It was a female leopard. We didn't even see her. She was lying literally there. She jumped up with a growl. We both got the fright of our lives, I must be honest with you. And then she just casually walked into the trees and sat watching us as if we were the most comical thing that she's ever seen. Like, how could these humans possibly disturb my sand bath this afternoon? Pretty interesting story. It's going to stay with me for many years, I must say. Scott almost wearing Karula as a helmet that day. I think he was that close to her. And how a leopard, the camouflage that she had was so good that even two trained field guides with all the years of experience we couldn't see her on this open area. And you'd think to yourself, but come now, man. You know, it's a hundred pound cat that you're looking at hiding in amongst nothing. But she did. I don't see any tracks here. Not to say anything, here's another road that's coming out in this way. Let's see when we get to this junction. Leopard enjoy walking on game paths. And game paths are pathways, obviously, that animals have walked from one place to another, usually to water and from water. And leopard and lion quite enjoy walking on these game paths. And when humans first came to this area, didn't have the sophisticated four-wheel drive vehicles that we have of today and so they used to drive there's some tracks there on the right hand side but they're from hyena not from leopard and they used to drive on these game paths obviously it's the best place to look for animals and secondly the game paths were easy to access for for their vehicles that they used to use and so the roads that we use today are predominantly well, a lot of them are on old game paths that are still traditionally used by animals up and down all over the place. And leopard and lion in particular quite enjoy walking on game paths and therefore quite enjoy walking on roads. And quite often to spend a little bit of time deciphering what has been moving up and down these roads is an easy way to find what has been in the area. In this particular case, only some hyena from last night and a zebra crossed over there so nothing much at that junction I quite enjoy this crest there's a couple of really large marula trees and then we've got these green thorns that tree that you're seeing over there that's a green thorn or a torchwood they produce a little fruit, a berry, basically, that's about this big. And inside is a nut. And in that nut is a lot of oil that's highly flammable. And that oil used to be collected and used to soak rags and those pitch torches. Uh, is a protected tree in this area. You can't cut it down. One of only about eight trees here that is protected we need to know all of them so often we crash through the bush over here it looks like we crash through quite haphazardly but we don't really there's certain trees that you don't drive over and not for anything um i suppose i could try and name a few of what those trees are for you we've got the green thorn leadwood tamburti uh, jackalberry, um, weeping boar bean, hmm, I'm missing the last two, matumi would be one, and the last one, you're going to have to give me a second to think of the last one, it's been many years since I've had to try and recite the eight protected trees from this area of the Kruger National Park. Doesn't trees when I can't even name them, hey. But I know them by sight, don't worry. I'm just trying to rack my brain now to think of that other one. <laughs> Discredit myself here quickly. Right, and in front of us we've got a safari vehicle coming down the road. We do operate in an area that has 
other safari companies working on it. They're generally based in the tourism industry. And on this car will be a collection of tourists. Now, we don't put the camera on the tourists. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of issues with disclaimers and things like that. We don't want to invade anyone's privacy. But I might have to stop and converse with this ranger just to get a quick update on what he's seen for the afternoon. We use each other as an informant network. And it's a good way of getting and cutting down. But I think while I do that, it'll be a good time for you not to have to sit and stare into the sky. You can be off to Jamie, I'll give you an update and we'll catch up with you on the other side of this interview. My only update for the moment is that all of the animals seem to be as surprised as we are at this incredibly warm weather and they've all gone into hiding. They appear to be disappearing behind bushes. There's a Dacre there but he's gone already. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he's completely gone very quickly. So I've returned back to the area where we had the male leopard tracks but I'm sort of I'm not a hundred percent confident that that leopard is anywhere on this property. Those tracks were from early last night and my suspicion was that it is or is that it was Tingana going off the property and towards the southern side of the property. I don't know that with a hundred percent certainty but I just have this feeling that that might be the case. But I'm checking here just in case because as Steph said leopards don't read the textbooks and particularly with leopards they'll wander around in the middle of the day no matter how warm it is particularly if they're hungry. Now it's been a long time since we've seen Tingana he seems to do he waits until nightfall and then he wanders straight through Juma and out the other side but he's got to be around somewhere at some point soon Herbert says he's in sitting in final control. Herbert says that he will give all the animals a call so that we can meet up with them. Yes, please, Herbie. That would definitely be hugely appreciated since they all, the last two days, have gone from exceptionally busy to very, very quiet. Animals are taking a holiday from being on camera. Kind of like James, but just a bit different. Nope, nothing here. Evidence of elephants absolutely everywhere, trees in the road. The elephants are also playing hide and seek with us for now. We'll just have to seek harder as we trundle along. Our Laura Brown, thinking about our visions of expanding to other parts of the world. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. Now Laura would like to know if we could take a safari live anywhere in the world, where would we take it or go anywhere in the world and take safari live with us? Laura, I often think about this question and it depends on the day that you ask me. That changes what my answer might be. I mean, at the moment, the idea of the gorillas sounds absolutely magical. But that's because, of course, we've had all of the gorilla stuff happening. Um, sure, so many, so many amazing places to go. I'd love to go to India. I'd love to, I mean, imagine seeing tigers on a live safari. Imagine seeing wolves hunting on a live safari going to North Americas. Where else? I mean, seeing bears on live safaris, going into the ocean. The, the, the options are just, there's so many of them. Or just staying closer to home and going to other parts of southern Africa, into Botswana, into Zambia. Go and explore different places and get to know different animals. There's so many exciting possibilities. And who knows? Graham Wallington and the rest of the Wild Earth team I know we are always pushing to break ground and change things. And there are distinct possibilities for the future. And we look forward to exciting times ahead. Laura, where would you take 
the team? If you could up and move, well not necessarily up and move, but if you could expand Safari Live, where would you want us to go? South America, go see the Jaguars. Go into Russia, see snow leopards, panda bears, polar bears. I like that. I'm going to turn Laura's question around for all of you. If you could send us to one place, where would it be? But you can only choose one for now. Or would you keep us right? Let's make it more difficult. If you could send us to any place in the world, where would you send us? But you can choose Juma as well. You could choose for us to stay, but it could only be one place. Where would we be in the world? If, we, if I could only choose one place, here is where I'd be. In the South African low felt is absolutely what I would choose if I only had one choice. Now send us through the answer to that question. You can send that through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv or anything else that you might like to ask about or comment on. Perhaps if you know where all the animals are and if perhaps you can tell me where Herbie has arranged for them to meet me if you could let me know that would be hugely appreciated I found an animal voila there is an animal it's quite far away and it's sitting on a termite mound watching me with some somewhat of a nervous expression we have one of our slightly less relaxed families of dwarf mongoose on Philemon's cut line Oh, he's actually giving us a really nice example of the way that they maintain their burrows. This is probably an old bolt hole that this little dwarf mongoose was now excavating. And he's gone. Hmm. Oh, there's some more. Here comes another one. Running down the side of the termite mound, quite possibly to go join his friend. Uh, that one's gone too. And there's one more coming through. Oh, and that one is nearly gone too. Nope, it's gone too. Next. Any more? Yep, here comes one at a fast pace. Oh, it's gone on the other side. Oh, there goes another one. <laughs> Underneath. Oh, no, they're coming out again. They are coming out again. Sort of. Right, so our little smallest carnivore doesn't actually, well, smallest, smallest mammalian carnivore are feeling, they're feeling a little bit camera shy. The nice thing about dwarf mongoose is they usually overcome their nervousness relatively quickly. Aha, I heard an elephant. Here we go. They're slowly starting to gain confidence. And moving about around the termite mound. <laughs> Investigating the various holes. Might be a while since they've used this den site. And they're going in to check and open up the various tunnels, make sure that they've got bolt holes for as it starts to get dark and it's time to go to bed. Yes, little ones. Okay. Well, since our dwarf mongoose are feeling relatively shy and are quite far away, perhaps we should go off in search of that elephant that I heard. Because I'm sure I heard one. Not too far away from here. Quite possibly somewhere in that general direction. Go and investigate. I think it feels like a good afternoon for an elephant sighting. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think of Australia, so lots of answers coming through from all of you across the world suggesting Alaska and Australia, and I've forgotten the rest. Masai Mara. Sorry. 
a little bit of short-term memory loss happening there. Often when I'm thinking of several other things at once, poor Rebecca has to repeat herself because it goes in that ear and straight out the other and into the ether somewhere. So Masai Mara would be an amazing one. I know that is something... Uh, ooh, I better be careful what I say. Let's just say it's definitely something we have thought about and had conversations about because going across in that direction and watching the Great Migration would also be something extraordinary. Of course, Scott Dyson has, and Nikki have been posting some amazing images on their social media accounts. Scott and Nikki, of course, used to work here. We were just, you know, on the subject of um, Steph's fly problem and his manically waving hands, which is a, a perennial problem. It's not new. I don't know whether Steph has mentioned his elephant dung burning bucket, but he does have an elephant dung burning bucket to help him try and get rid of the flies surrounding him. But um, Scott, speaking of Scott, Steph and I were just chatting about this earlier. Scott had this incredible ability to sit completely still. And I can't, I can't do it. There's no way on earth. I used to cringe watching it. Watching the flies crawl towards the corner of his eye and up towards his nose. And he didn't move. He just would look into the camera and carry on talking. I don't know how he mastered that skill. Because I can promise you now it is not something I would ever manage. Ha! There's something in this weather. The wind is starting to howl. Gusting in the way that it does when the southern parts of the country are sending us their bad weather. Which is, I think, exactly what is about to happen. I don't know whether the wind is going to start up tonight or tomorrow. disgusting wind I think tells me it's, it's I did say it's too warm it is far too warm July is waiting to lull us into a false sense of security before clamping down with an icy grip Oh, I love that answer from Gracie, who's eight years old and one of our regular viewers. Now, Gracie says that she would really love to see koala bears and wouldn't that be fun? But at the same time, she would really, really miss her hippos and her elephants. It's a good point, Gracie. And don't worry, if we ever go anywhere else in the world, we'll never ever leave this place without a team being on Safari Live. So. We will always be able to show you hippos and elephants. And I'm trying to find you an elephant now, Gracie. I'm trying to find everybody an elephant now. He's in here somewhere because I heard him. In fact, I heard him releasing digestive gases. <laughs> I have to chuckle at that. Eileen has made a very good point. She said she would like to send us to Canada to see how we cope with the cold. <laughs> well, gauging by the way that we cope with our very temperate climate in midwinter, where we shiver our way around when it's still over 40 degrees Fahrenheit, Eileen makes a very, very valid point. Um, I'm not sure how we would cope, Eileen. I don't think very well. Dave is, Dave is grinning. I think Dave can picture it. Brian, I'm not sure what would happen to Brian. I don't think he can wear any more coats and still be able to move. Maybe don't send us to Canada in winter, please. <laughs> we'll get very, very cold. All right, while I continue on the search for this elephant that I'm certain I heard, let's go across to Steph and find out if he's having any more luck than I am. I love Jamie's story. She's really just got such a way of putting it. And then those big eyes and that big smile that you can't help but believe it. But it's, I don't only have to be plagued by flies. I mean, there are other things to be plagued with in this life as well. But they do tend to, to bother me quite a lot. And I did make a tin 
and it does burn elephant dung and I will bring it with on safari tomorrow I'll show you exactly how it works we can try not set the world alight with it but it actually works quite well it has a double effect in that it makes us quite it makes me quite lightheaded the, the, the herbs and that in the elephant dung that sort of waft over you in the smoke um, have a very numbing effect on your frontal lobe but I'll share some of that with you tomorrow I'll bring it with tomorrow we've got a drag mark on the floor over here now why drag marks are so significant is that, generally speaking, at the end of a drag mark is a predator of some sort. Now, initially I got quite excited because that looks very similar to a leopard drag mark. You can see the body or the leg on the left-hand side, and then those wavy ones on the right-hand side, that is where a horn or a leg has been bumped by the shoulder of whatever was carrying it so you can imagine something quite large in the mouth dragging on the floor with a floppy bit bumping on the left hand side now the easy thing to think of is a leopard because leopard they like killing things in one place and then before it gets stolen they run away with it and they hide it generally in the top of a tree and that way they minimize competition for their food source. They take out our hina, which are for, for leopard, uh, one of their primary sources of competition and stealing food from them. In this particular case, the hina has already stole this particular piece of food and has run away with it so that it can get away from its brethren. Only hyena tracks are present in this particular drag mark and they can sometimes drag their prey for kilometers. This, I think, was just dragged away from where it was found and then came down here. And the only thing that's inside there is hyena tracks. Not a very big hyena from the tracks as well. Let me see if I can show you where it came from. Quite often you get big male leopard that will go and re-steal their kills from hyena that have... Uh, that have taken it from them. Leopard will drag their kills up into a tree and then what happens is it drops. There we can see a drag mark coming from coming from down there. I just want to have a double check and just make 100% sure that it is that it 100% is a uh, a hyena. Quite often what happens is a leopard will drag a carcass into a tree and then bump it and it falls out and the hyena is waiting at the bottom will take that carcass and drag it away and the, hyena, the leopard will actually follow the hyena and steal it back if he can get a chance to. But in this particular case, unfortunately, just hyena that have stolen this from somewhere. So either they killed it themselves, it's very possible that they may have killed it themselves, or they've stolen a kill from a leopard in the area, or maybe even stolen a bit of the kill from lions. Anything's possible. And this one hyena has run off with his prize go and devour it in peace somewhere. So not really worth following and that's because it probably happened last night and in the case of something that you could drag away it would be finished already or miles and miles away from here. What I do want to do is go in the direction that that drag mark came from. Perhaps at the end of that drag mark there's some lions, especially the lions that we've been looking for. This is a part of the reserve I didn't drive this morning. So I'm not too sure what could be waiting around the corner for us. Distinct lack of any vulture activity. you just remarked that 
that lionesses don't draw or you haven't ever heard a lioness roar and you wanted to know if they do vocalize well i can confirm erin that lion and lioness absolutely do roar lioness roar as much as what male lions do when they're all together they also make a whole variety of different calls they can growl they can they have a contact call for cubs which is a soft mewling noise um, they make a whole range of calls. I think it would be a good idea next time you're with lions that have, lion, that have cubs around, listen carefully. The guides quite often will uh, tell you that the lion is making a contact call or calling their cubs. When lions have been hunting, they sometimes get lost and then they call for one another. Not lost, but they lose one another in the, in the, in the melee. And then obviously lions as a cohesive whole will roar at prides adjacent to their territories to keep those prides at bay and there the females roar um, and to the un, to, to an unexperienced ear the females roar sounds almost identical to the males roar except in bass and length of call so absolutely keep watching you at some point you will see lions vocalizing and lioness vocalizing Ah, Gert's eagle eye has just spotted an eagle. We don't have much zoom, but that is unmistakable pose of a batelier eagle. I know it's a batelier because of those red legs that are unfeathered, the size, the red face, and the black plumage. Batelier eagle and it's a full-grown adult and I know that because it's black juveniles are brown Beautiful beautiful eagle Airplane that's just flown over I wonder if that bird thinks that that does some sort of big airplane I'd love to know what's going through that bird's mind at the moment actually just sitting down and resting these birds are built fantastically they're built for gliding and they have very short tails very similar to a vulture that limits drag obviously with 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 a bigger tail the more you have drag the less efficient your your glide will be and once they hit thermals these birds can glide up to 200 kilometers a day and never have to flap their wings they've got a very distinctive flight because of their short tail. It's quite a wobbly flight. Very distinctly shaped wings. Looks very similar to the modern day bomber aircraft wings. Funny shaped wings. Clipped points. No tail. And then that distinctive black color that you see on those birds. Now there is a nest around this area, so I think that the, uh, this particular bird is close to the nest. They do have a juvenile, they did have a juvenile. The last time I've, I actually had anything to do with these eagles, which was a couple of months ago. You might actually find that they've fledged that particular chick. He's full, or she's full, not wanting to fly around too much. Birds operate within a very strict weight category. Too heavy, they don't fly. Too light, they don't have enough energy to fly. And so birds, the diet for birds is very, very important. And what you might find here is this bird who's primarily a carrion eater. They eat the leftovers at kills. May have fed recently on a kill somewhere. And he's sitting in the tree, just digesting it. Working off some of that weight. But it could be any variety of reasons. Very nice spot that. So, full grown Batelier Eagle. Or short tailed Snake Eagle, as they were called for a while before they went back to Batelier. So 
Deborah, armchair traveler, has uh, just asked if I've seen any blue-cheeked bee eaters in this area. Yes, I have seen a blue-cheeked bee eater. Uh, um, I saw it at Sabi Sabi, and apparently it's a rare visitor. It does occur here, a rare visitor. They're a little bit more common on the Lubombo mountain ranges further east of where we are, although even though I'd worked there for five years, I never saw one. Um, and then as you go further up into the park, then blue-cheeked bee eaters become a little bit more prevalent. Let me show you, for those who don't know what a blue-cheeked bee eater is, let me show you what one is. I just want to get into this herd of impala while I page my way through my book. You can have a look at that and then I'll find you a blue-cheeked bee eater quickly so I can show you what one looks like. I quite enjoy the bee eaters only because they're colorful. So here are the bee eaters here, and this is the blue-eared bee eater, this one. By far the more common of the bee eaters around here is this one here, the European bee eater in summertime. And also in summertime, deep summer, January, the carmine bee eater. And then a resident bee eater that stays here all year round is the little bee eater, this one here. Oh, and this one is also here, but you don't find them that much in this particular part, the white-fronted bee eater. Colorful birds, eh? Very, very nice birds. So, old Deborah Armchair Traveler, I hope have you seen a blue-eared bee, bee eater? I know they appear on some birders' lists in this area. I think the best time is if you do watch this show often, the best time for those types of birds is when we've had a really wet year and there's been a lot of insects that have come in with that year, inundation of insects. And then these bee eaters come down from their natural ranges, come down further into this part of the park. And around January, February probably would be December, January, February would be the best time to see these birds here. But Tom, all the way from Dallas, I want to say, well, it's, it's a good day to you, Tom. Um, you've asked our vulture numbers increasing because of the drought. Um, that's a good question, Tom. I mean, I can't imagine that they wouldn't be doing well because of all the animals that are dying in the drought. I can't imagine that, that their numbers are declining because of lack of food. Um, but in general, vulture numbers here are declining drastically because of the medicine trade associated to the various body parts of a vulture and um, you do find in these areas which are fringed to the very sides of the game reserve we're not deep inside the game reserves that and also vultures travel immense distances that these vultures are lured in to carcasses that are left out specifically for that and then killed with a catapult or a rifle and then their body parts are sold for traditional medicine that's the that's the current cause of their demise. In past years, they were victims to, um, to, to pesticides that have an accumulative effect, things like strychnine um, that were placed in carcasses to kill jackal and caracal and leopard for stock theft were being picked up by vultures and they were victims, innocent victims of those types of atrocities. But lately, or lately I should say, it's primarily just the traditional medicine trade. And I think that they're dying at a rate that the drought wouldn't have too much of an effect on just yet. This drought, don't forget, though it's been dry for two years, um, it's only really this year where we haven't had any rain. It's not uncommon for droughts to last up to a decade. Can you imagine having 10 successive years of drought like we're having at the moment? What this place would look like, how different it would look. 
No, I'm just running my imagination, running away with me over there, trying to imagine what this place would look like after 10 years of drought. It's, it's incredible. But there's every... There's... Um, we're just going to rub the lens clean quickly, so don't get a fright when your picture disappears. <laughs> it's just Gert's lens cloth. We're having a little bit of reflection coming off the glass there. All sorted. Now, there's every prediction that there's going to be a wet year this year. There's a, um, I don't know what to call it, there's a set of circumstances that is brewing just on the western side of South America. It's called the La Nina. And what it is, it's a colder than average current that wells up in the Pacific in that area and has quite a drastic effect on weather patterns in the southern hemisphere. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. That was very close to my microphone. I'm sorry if you're all deaf after that. <laughs> Please excuse me. Yo. I'm trying to battle off the last vestiges of cold over the last couple of days and then dust clouds blowing up from under the wheels of here it doesn't make it any easier not to sneeze. Yo. Um, so back to La Nina. So this La Nina effect is a unusually cold current that wells up just on the, uh, or I suppose around the Galapagos would be the easiest way for me to explain where it is. And it has a dramatic effect on weather patterns in the southern hemisphere all the way around. We've got another eagle sitting here. Oh, my alarm bells. Although this is the same valley that those bateliers have got their nest on. And we've just seen the other member of this particular pair sitting in a tree not far away. I don't quite know what eagle this is. I'm busy looking into the sun at the moment. It's very difficult for me to to tell you what eagle this actually is. It looks like she's got a full crop as well. My alarm bells are going off. Full cropped eagles sitting in a tree. Why are they here? What's made them full? What did they eat? I still don't know what eagle this is. I'm busy looking straight into the sun, so I can't see any colors on it whatsoever. I think it's a Batelier eagle. Yes, it's a Batelier eagle. Let's see. Uh, there we go. She flew away. Definitely a Batelier. That flappy pattern that you see there. There we go. That wobbly flight pattern. Whoa, whoa. And then that very fast flap, wobble, wobble. That is absolutely Batelier. Let's see if she comes into land. Let's just go into the open here. Yeah? Wow, she's flying fast. She's flying down the valley. Let's see if she gets some height. I can't see her at all now. She's just flown down the valley. Um, I wanted to see if she was going to land somewhere. But she probably has. It's just out of sight now. She flew in the direction of where the nest is. So where she was in this valley, she's flown now in the direction of that nest, which is also back to where we saw that other batelier in the tree. So I, I think it's probably just uh, the pair of bateliers that live inside this valley, that have their nest inside this valley, that were just sitting on these prominent sticks. Um, I don't think that there's a kill here, although why her crop was full, why are they sitting around this time of the afternoon, there's still a lot of hunting to be done. Maybe because of the drought, they're getting a lot of their food uh, in a shorter space of time. So they're needing to forage for food a lot less because of the drought and more animals lying dead. Um, and they don't need to fly around as much as they would say in summertime where um, kills are, are scattered and quite scarce. Who knows? Good riddle, actually. Yeah, there's a Nyala carcass that uh, Jamie was at a little bit earlier on today and there's a very good chance that they were feeding on that and have now just come back to their valley to digest for the evening. So it could be anything. Exciting. 
I like these mysteries that you don't quite know what's going on or what's around the next corner. Now, if we had seen the Batelier eagle in conjunction with a tawny eagle and some vultures, that means that there's definitely a kill there. So Batelier eagle and tawny eagle, when they're together, there's absolutely a kill there. When quite often the vultures are looking at Bateliers and tawnies that fly a lot lower than what they do and can see a lot easier on the ground, the vultures are responding to Bateliers and tawnies sitting in the tree. Look, there was also that drag mark. Hmm. But Granny and Joe have just asked me, a, well, just made a remark actually, that they haven't seen those little yellow weavers that make those gorgeous hanging nests. Um, quite simply, it's just too dry for them to, to do it. They start building those nests again as soon as the first rains hit. So we'll start seeing the weavers start to build those basket-shaped nests as soon as the grass starts, starts to grow and as soon as there's enough water for them to do that. And we'll start seeing them doing that probably, depending on when the rain starts, but anywhere from sort of the end of September through to the beginning of January is when we have the high time of nest building happening. Right now, back to my, my, we had that drag mark from that Ahina coming out of this area. We've got two bateliers that are full, their crops are full. Hmm. Let's go down this road and see what we can see. It's not a road that I traveled down this morning. No tracks here. But it is going into the area where that drag mark came from. And who knows? Still no solid track of anything, and I'm scanning the horizon here, seeing if I can see any birds sitting in trees, any vultures sitting in trees. Hey, these cold case files. When I finished guiding one day, I could go and give the police a hand sifting through. Ages of old information looking for connections. The sun is particularly bright today, but I think it's because of this diffused nature, all the dust in the air. I predict another quite red, goldy sunset. Nice big red ball that goes down below the horizon with all the dust in the atmosphere at the moment. From what I'm told, the Cape, our Western Cape and Cape Town is just basically having a bunch of cold fronts slamming into them at the moment. They're actually predicting snow on top of the escarpment, not far away from here on Monday and Tuesday, so this unnaturally warm weather could be as a precursor to that. Anyway, while we bump down this road and have a look, Jamie's got an update for you. <laughs> hey. oh, my update was that I have decided to come across to Cheetah Plains in the hope that the animals will be flocking here from the Kruger National Park to come and have a drink at the Cheetah Plains Pan. Basically I'm following the exact same logic from yesterday. Didn't work yesterday but you know, definition of madness and all that. I'm hoping that the cheetah have decided to come back to the north and onto the open area where there will be a flock of ostriches to draw their attention. Just putting it out there. Just putting it out there in the ether. But first we'll go and check three in a row pan which is now two in a row mud wallow since they've had to choose between pumping three in a row pan and cheetah plains pan. Now there's two different water sources here. Now we'll check the muddy part first. There's a little bit of water still so the eddies might have decided to come across in this direction. That's what I'm hoping for anyway. We did have a steering book by the way back there but unfortunately because it is live and we are filming wildlife it decided that it wasn't going to stick around. Just disappeared as Steph sent you across to us. OK, 
Okay, let us see what Cheetah Plains pan, oh no, sorry, three in a row pan has to offer. Well, the last time I came through here, we found just at the end of the sunset safari yesterday, we found an old drag mark that I suggested might be from hyenas. We never, we couldn't really figure it out and unfortunately it was getting too dark for us to investigate fully. So we'll head back across there at some point, unless of course we have cheetah bounding across the plains. I'm still hopeful. So that was the first three, in, first of the three in a row pans that we've just come past. This is three in a row pan number two. Minus water. Is just mud at the moment. Not much happening here. Oh, it was a, it was a fork-tailed drongo. Sorry, that flew past. It was just very low to the ground. I thought it was something scampering away from us. This is three in a row pan number three. Also, again, just mud. Now just bear with me one moment. Let me find you something to look at while I do this. Okay, it's a bit, opportunities are a bit slim on the ground. So just bear with me while we drive to the clearings. I want to just chat to Peter. Peter, Peter for Jamie. Please work, please work, please work. Afternoon, Peter. You're the only station I can copy. Can I have an update for Cheetah Plains? Okay, copy that. Thanks, Peter. Um, and any sign of Shkang Kang? Copy that. Thank you. Aha, I have found you something to look at. There's a huge herd of breeding, a breeding, a huge breeding herd of buffalo <laughs> in the trees. But they're very far away, so let's just try and get ahead of them because they are heading across in this direction. How lovely. Perhaps they will make their way towards the clearings and we can have clouds of dust and buffalo everywhere. Hello buffalo. Oh, I said breeding herd. I think I, I think it's a breeding herd. it is all hiding in the what's known as monkey orange here we go there's a big buffalo bull giving us a look that James described as well, James I think summed up perfectly how buffalo look at us they look at you like you owe them money that I think is absolutely spot on hello buffalo I don't owe you any money I promise I definitely don't. But you can sort of see what James means when he looks at you like that. Now we often talk about, particularly with the old buffalo bulls, we refer to them as dugger boys and they're one of the most, or responsible for the most injuries in terms of human buffalo inter or human animal interaction out here on foot. That's because they're particularly grumpy. Now, Michael you want to know whether buffalo ever chase other animals or are recorded chasing other animals? Yes, they do. They often, with, especially around water, they often will chase the smaller antelope species away. There's a red crested corhorn. <laughs> Calling in the distance. Oh, I think we're going to actually have a really nice view with the dust. 
up ahead. Let's just go further afield. So Michael, they chase the smaller antelope species kind of half-heartedly though. I've never seen them be particularly aggressive towards I mean they don't they don't try to follow through with their chasing of them. They're not actively setting out to attack anything. Hello beefaloes. For the most part the breeding herds are one of the most placid things that you can walk on foot. It's okay guys. A little bit nervy in this wind. Let's just stop here. Give them a second to relax. It's okay buffalo. Ah, oh, that sun's just at the wrong height. I was hoping we might capture the dust as they come towards us. Alright, here's what I want to do. I want to try and get, oh my word, it's actually a huge herd. Now that I look at it, there are lots of them in front of us. Unfortunately, this is one of the trickier spots to try and get you a really nice view of them. It's the sort of scene that you wish to see with in, out in an open area so you can get an idea of their numbers. And the unfortunate thing is we've just missed them drinking. And the reason I know that is have a look at this buffalo bull and have a look at his legs. They've been into three in a row pan, all the mud wallows, as they essentially are now. And they've been waiting in there to go and drink. So we must have just, just missed them coming through that area. There you go, the mud's still soaking wet on this buffalo. But as I said, the breeding herds actually tend to be relatively peaceable animals. Alrighty, uh, I'm going to reposition to get us a different view of the buffalo. While I do that, let's head back over to Steph. Alright, welcome back with us. And we are driving pretty much the last two roads that I haven't driven since yesterday. So since we were with those lioness last night, between then and now, I've pretty much driven every single road that's on this side of the Milwati drainage line, which is the big drainage line that runs through the center of Juma. And I still haven't found any tracks of these lioness. I'm still convinced in my mind that they are somewhere around Buffelshook Dam. Everything's just telling me that they're there. Bataliers that are full, I hear walking from that direction. No tracks really leading across any of the roads that we've got here. And so that's basically what we're going to do now, I'm going to go down, this is Vulture's Nest Road, named after a vulture's nest that I think used to be in this tree, which is now a African hawk eagle's nest. I'll show you the nest now, we can actually see it from here. Just want to keep on scanning. The nest is that collection of sticks that you see in that fork. That there, that was the, it's an African hawk eagle's nest. And that is where this particular road gets its name from. Now I know the lions, those in Kahuma females enjoy walking through this area. They've killed a number of buffalo that live in this particular area. The most recent being about 200 meters in this direction. They killed a buffalo that we only found a couple of days in because we only saw vultures very late. Um, and then we tracked in there and we bumped into these Inkahumas feasting on a buffalo. Don't see any vultures sitting in trees now though. So we've got one more road to do. We've got a hyena road to do, which isn't a road that I have associated with lions a lot in the past, although it's a road that lies pretty close to the Buffalshook Dam. And we, well, I have seen the Birmingham boys on it a couple of times. It is just here somewhere. 
Oh, it's just such a beautiful afternoon. It's going to make for a fantastic sunset today, I think. It's already starting to cool down. The sun's still quite intense, but it's already starting to cool down a little bit. Nice stiff breeze blowing. I'm trying to keep my head on a swivel while we are trying to chat to you. I must be honest with you, I'm quite glad Herbert's back. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm quite glad Herbert's back. He already contacted me a couple of times during the drive to ask me where he can go and follow up on some tracks. And I know it's a... You have a man of his skills out here that can follow tracks like he does absolutely such a huge benefit. Now for those of you thinking about coming to Africa at some point, especially in winter time, um, different times of the year are very different for different things. In the, dry, in the drier times, in the dry times of the year in the winter, the temperatures go very cold, it'll go down to freezing, very close to freezing. Now this kudu is exhibiting a typical, have a look at that full belly that she's got, but she's lost a bit of condition. You can't really see it from this angle. She's got an incredibly swollen belly, but you can see that she's not in her best. She looks okay from this particular angle, but she is a bit skinny. You can see that saddle and her hips and, and pelvis are a bit shrunken in there. Picking at these leaves. Now, kudu are ruminants. And ruminants are incredibly good at taking out a lot of high-protein nutrients from a lot of high-quality plants. But in times like this, in drier times like this, what happens is their rumen fills up, and it fills up with very low-grade food. And what the, their body's trying to do is extract every last little bit of nutrients out of very low-grade food. And that is the, apart from all the good things that having a ruminating digestive system gives you in the summertime, in the drought, it is an absolute hamper. So she has got a full belly, but with very low-grade food and quite often they will starve to death with a full belly. I know it sounds pretty weird but their digestive system is too slow to release enough nutrients to give them the metabolic energy they need in a 24-hour period. So they can't eat enough to, to give themselves the, 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 the nutrients that they, that they need and this kudu is exhibiting very typical signs like that. Frantic eating a full belly and starving. Just another sign of the times. See her with her trumpet shaped ears. That's not uncommon for Kudu to lose condition in, in winter. I'm painting a very bleak picture there, but don't worry yourselves, don't overly concern yourselves. Kudu are very good at adapting to this particular type of, uh, of, of environment. They've been living here for thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. So Kudu are very well adapted to the drought. This part of the country is an arid part of the country. It is, uh, although we are classified as savanna here, we are a dry savanna, semi-arid country. So a Kudu that goes through a little bit of condition loss going into the dry season is completely normal. The hope is that she does find some high quality leaves somewhere. For instance, on this buffalo thorn. This buffalo thorn right here is very very good food for a kudu. A little bit left, sorry cat. There we go. That is very very good food for a kudu. Those leaves there are some of the most high protein leaves that you can get and still very very close to a kudu's feeding level so there's still a lot of these leaves around. She's walking behind us over here. Let's see what she does. She's going to come out of the bush into frame now. Uh, 
Uh, James Richard has just asked me which tree or species of plant has the deepest root structure in the area. Uh, James, tough to say, I would have to go with one of the acacias, probably the knob thorn, only because it's the, the largest of the acacias. They have a very deep taproot system. And so I would say that it's probably the knob thorn. However, I'm making an educated guess there. I um, just want to reverse so that this could is in frame. I don't actually know which tree here has the deepest taproot system. I do know acacias have very deep roots and therefore why I said the knob thorn was because the knob thorn acacia is the largest of the acacias and presumably would have the deepest root. Very delicate the way that these kudu actually eat the bushes that they do. They use the, their lips and they nibble keeping those massive trumpet-shaped ears swinging from side to side. Always keeping one on us. You can see as she's feeding, she's keeping one trumpet pointed to us all the time. That pink hue that's inside that kudu's ear, characteristic of the kudu's. Highly variable diet. They eat about 150 different species of trees. Only the elephant eats more species of bush than what the kudu does. Wow, they are beautiful animals, aren't they? She probably weighs in the region of about 120 kilograms, so about 250 pounds. They get a little bit heavier than that. I think one of the heaviest kudu you'll get in females is about 150 kilograms or so 300 pounds or so. And there you can see. James has just asked, do browsers or grazers have longer tongues? And which species of animal has the longest tongue? Well, James, I would imagine that grazers would have the longest, would have longer tongues on average than what browsers would have. But this is where I'm going to throw it. The giraffe has the longest tongue of all. It has a 30 centimeter tongue. And it's because it uses its tongue as almost a prehensile arm to grab bushes and trees around it. So I would say on average, grazers have longer tongues than browsers. And I would say that apart from that, the one record holder is the giraffe, which has a massively long tongue. And that's out of large mammals. The chameleon obviously has one of the largest or longest tongues in Mother Nature. stretching many times his own body length. So when you start opening it up to any of the animals around, I think the chameleon probably holds the world record at having the longest tongue per body length volume that you get. So for me, it's the chameleon. A giraffe can never stretch its tongue. What would it be? 25 meters out the side of its face to get the branch. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> anyway. Let's carry on to Hyena Road. It shows much promise with kudu and impala around here. There's a stocked larder. Quite a sizable herd of kudu with a young kudu bull. It's him over there. Just starting to come into his coat. He's a two-year-old kudu bull. Three, two to going on to three years old. And they actually got quite good coats at this particular age. This and for another about year, his coat is, will be for me some of the most colorful in his life. As he gets a bit older, he'll become more impressive with his horns and his dewlap of, of, of hair. But they tend to lose a bit of hair on their necks and flanks. So their variation of color changes. They are impressive when they're bigger. He's a youngster still. He will be in his prime in another five years or so. One of the favorite 
foods of a lion. And funny enough, speaking to that scientist we were speaking of today, we mentioned to him about quarantine's affinity for catching. Quarantine is a, is a male leopard, one of Karula, the dominant female in this area's sons, most recent adult sons in actual fact. And um, he has this affinity for catching kudu, full-grown female kudu. He catches quite often on a regular basis. And we pitched this at the scientist today who was visiting our camp. And he said it's, he's encountered it a couple of times before in his past where leopards just seem to have a knack for catching a, spe- a particular species of animal. And no matter where you find this leopard, no matter where they go in their life, they carry this knack with it. Unlike lion, who hunt the most common game in that area very well, leopards tend to favor some or other type of prey species over another, and it's almost like an individualistic thing. I think it's just down to the intelligence of leopard. Leopards are incredibly intelligent. They have about the same brain size as what a lion does, only they are a quarter of the weight. So, you know, how you measure intelligence is brain weight to body mass. It's a ratio. And so leopard, just by using that simple ratio, will be a lot more intelligent than what lion are. They're a lot more adaptable than what lion are. But just from those, co- those comments today, it would absolutely make sense that leopard would not be as instinctual or as reactive to an environment, that they'd actually be more charismatic, that have a little bit more character, and that character allows them to have favorites, I suppose. In this particular case, kudu. Anyway, on that note, we're going to be sending you over to Jamie and we're going to catch up with you, I suppose, on the other side of Hyena Road. Oh, welcome back onto the back of Rusty. For those of you who were wondering what we were doing, we were experimenting. The experiment didn't exactly go according to plan, but we're back up and running and heading through to the Cheetah Plains Plains part. Now, unfortunately, our buffalo herd moved into some very, very thick vegetation. And not only were they, did they move in there, but they showed every sign of wanting to stay in there. Sorry, there's something wrong with my radio so that it's now beeping at me furiously, just constantly. Please don't. Stop it, radio. Oh, goodness. Just might need to turn it down completely. Just hold it a second, I'm gonna try and show you what's happening. Uh, it's stopped now. Okay, good. I was gonna try and give you a demonstration. Okay. Hope everybody is thinking positive thoughts about a cheetah coming across finally from Mala Mala. I know I am. I'm very hopeful. At the moment lots of signs of elephants as well. No actual elephants but lots of signs of them. Sorry. Got fooled by hyena tracks. You want to be particularly careful in this area when you're looking for cheetah because at first glance you might be, maybe if I'm in a particularly forgiving mood, might be forgiven for mixing up cheetah and hyena tracks just because of the shape of them. They're complete, angled completely differently but you do get the claws very clearly visible and they're about the same size. At least it feels as though the wind is not too strong. Okie dokie, so I have a message straight from the big man himself. Graham Wallington would like to pass on the message to say that there was signal, there was mobile signal but unfortunately there wasn't 3D, no, not 3D, 3G signal. So he'd like to tell you all that it was a marvelous experience and they got lots of clips to show you that they will be sharing with everybody. 
Uh, he's sorry that it didn't work for the live streaming and that we didn't manage to get it across to you live, but it was a marvelous experience for them and they are looking forward to sharing it with all of you and I'm sure you're going to hear all about it in great depth and detail when Mr. Leo Smith returns back to our shores on, when will that be? That'll be the sunrise safari of Monday morning. these beautiful open patches in this area this is slightly more natural than the almost artificial like clearing of cheetah plains and this is actually what cheetah like to hunt in more than a completely bare area and the reason behind that is they actually as you know they can't maintain the speeds that they are famous for for very long which means that they actually have to sneak up very close to their prey before they launch their attack or else they run the risk of the prey having too large a head start and actually outpacing them and escaping them. Now, areas like this are really really good hunting spots for cheetah and I'm just so hoping that we've got the time of day right. I mean this happened to Dave and I once, be once before where we were the only people cruising around the Cheetah Plains area and we saw a Stienbock go racing away for no apparent reason. We were far away from it and because my gut instinct told me that there was something wrong with that behavior we stayed and we ended up finding the two Cheetah just wandering across into the open area and I'm hoping that might repeat itself now but I think I've set my mind too much upon it now Come on, or jackal, or ostrich, I'm actually not too fussy. Actually right now at this point, an animal or bird would do as well. I don't know why everything's hiding from me today. we are at that portion of the drive where my favorite question comes up which is from a new viewer called Carla and Carla oh my goodness it's a kudu themed day today just kudu everywhere hello little ones awesome oh Carla yes this is ready live and would like to extend a welcome to the entire from the entire Safari Live team to Carla who is a new viewer and I hope that you become as addicted as some of our other viewers have become this is 100% live it's also on twice a day every single day morning and afternoon and we have arrived at the great open area and Carla I'm not sure where you're from exactly or how familiar you are with the geography of this area but just over our kudu's heads probably about a mile or two, two kilometers depending upon where you are from is the Kruger National Park the world famous Kruger National Park in South Africa so yes 100 percent live and we love hearing from you you can send through any other questions that you have on hashtag safari live on Twitter or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv um, and believe it or not, Carla, kudu are not the only animal that we have out here. <laughs> Although we're certainly doing a very good impression of showing you all the kudu that we see. But we've also got lions and elephants and leopards and hopefully cheetah this afternoon. I've decided I'm still hopeful. Or a pangolin, Dave. Yes, yes you know, that promise still stands. Carissa, just on the subject of our kudu, you wanted to know if we only see if we see the greater and the lesser kudu in our area. 
And no, unfortunately, we don't get to see the lesser kudu. We only have the greater kudu in this area. So the slightly larger. I mean, they're essentially the same animal. There's some that would classify them as a subspecies, others that classify them as a completely separate species, and some more that argue that they are in fact neither. <laughs> Little one wandering off. But no, you have to go further north in Africa to see the lesser kudu. Look at them watching the other one try to relocate them. Okay, let us go and find something exciting on Cheetah Plains Plains. I think the animals know something we don't. Like there's going to be a terrifying drop in temperature in the next few hours. Right, so where we are at the moment, I've pointed out the world famous Kruger National Park. South of us is the famous Mala Mala private game reserve, where we cannot go, but we can look longingly across that to see whatever might be around there. But for the moment, it looks as though all is quiet on Mala Mala. Sometimes if you look really, really carefully, you spot something hiding in the shadows. But for now, I don't see anything. It's a bit tricky. Dave, if you find us something extraordinary, I'll be very, very impressed. You've got zebra? Well done, Dave. <laughs> We've got zebra about a kilometer away. Fantastic. I don't even I can't even see where you, where those are. Well done. I can't see them at all. I'm trying to look for cheetah in the shadows. But I think I might be pushing things a little bit. Oh I do see where your zebra are. Found three termite mounds and a couple of trees and two zebra standing in the traditional way that zebra very often do, which is head to rump, so as to look to basically ensure that they've got a 360 almost field of view in this open clearing. The wind is starting to come. You can see their tails swishing. I have to say, I think we can do better in terms of views of zebra. So let's carry on and see if we can't pick up on some jackal or anything else making its way in from the Kruger National Park. We are, of course, completely open to the Kruger National Park. There are no boundaries between us, a fact which we discovered accidentally when we got into trouble for driving on the wrong road. Luckily, that was all smoothed over relatively quickly because it was entirely innocent. Uh, while I search for something fascinating to show you on the plains, let's go across to Steph, who has also managed to find some buffalo. Yes, we bumped into the same buffalo that we were looking at at Biffles Hook Dam just now. They seem to have come out of the water and are moving off to feed for the night. So we came down the road, they're eating the grass here. I don't quite know what's chased them out of the water. Some good news is I found a fresh track of a lioness heading down a game path coming to Buffleshook Dam. And I'm predicting that it is the female with the babies. I don't know. We're going to go and check if she's come out of this on this game path that I do know. And then we bumped into these buffaloes. Oh, these guys are manky. Look at that face. You can see that tongue curling down, hooking the grass, and then they're cutting it off with their... Now, if you think I have a problem with flies, you must see these guys. I want to show you. If you go to their belly, there's a bare patch of skin on their belly. If you zoom in on that bare patch, 
All those little dots are all flies. <laughs> it's horrifying. And one of the things you must never do is when buffalo run away, they leave these flies behind. And I've driven behind a herd of buffalo, 600 buffalo strong. And they stampeded away from, from some lion. And I drove into this cloud of flies that these buffalo left behind. My senses were overwhelmed. Someone might as well have sprayed tear gas in my face. Have a look at those wickedly sharp horns. Massively thick neck. They can put those horns to good use. There's, there's a lot of footage out there of lions being tossed through the air. You know, a 500 pound lion being tossed through the air like a rag doll from these buffalo. Definitely not without a fight. And just because these buffalo are not with the herd doesn't necessarily mean that they are past it. Quite often large buffalo will hang around on the outskirts of these herds and only join the herd when, it, when the herd comes past them again. And when the herd leaves, they stay behind. They really have lion only to worry about. When they're young and strong, nothing really when they get a bit older and a bit slower and, and lion generally take them out like this guy you can see the top of his boss is hard and shiny have a look at all those creases and scars and wrinkles this buffalo has seen much in his life not scared of anything it's very difficult to intimidate a buffalo and you can see not really eating that grass and that's because that particular grass that he's overlooking has got almost no food value for a ruminating animal like a buffalo it's got no protein in it oh there we go fighting over the last little morsel and so they leave the tufts of unpalatable grasses only animals like warthog hippopotamus Elephant and they basically have, and zebra, have, um, have hind gut fermentation. They can eat large quantities of low grade grass. Only they can eat that. Jamie has found an elephant and I think it's going to be good to go and have a look before it disappears. I have actually found a parade of elephants coming in from the Kruger National Park to Cheetah Plains, quite possibly to go and have a drink at a Cheetah Plains pan. <laughs> Look at these two little ones at the back there, gathering the courage to follow mom, needing the encouragement from the elephant cow behind. Oh, look at her. Hello, big girl. You haven't got any tusks. Look at her head and the way that it's sunken in around the bones of her skull. There's something very odd about her face. Apart from the lock, lack of tusks, which is normal. It's very rare. It's relatively rare, but it is normal. I think she's quite an old elephant cow. And here comes the rest of the parade, slowly moving towards Cheetah Plains. And I love that. I love that feeling that we're sitting, looking into the Kruger National Park, a place that for me holds a childlike wonder still and watching the animals come through into our area. I've always loved those sorts of things. I've sat once on a rocky outcrop watching elephants come in from Botswana into South Africa across the Limpopo River and there's just such a sense of vastness and you can almost bring yourself to imagine can kind of take yourself back to a time when there were no boundaries and countries and fences and any of those ridiculous things to restrict where those beautiful animals can go. I love that feeling. I sit and imagine what it must have been like at a time when that river wasn't a boundary. Let's go forward a little bit. We'll catch them coming out onto the road. Hello, guys. And Tuscus elephants tend to be 
Well, especially the Tuscus females tend to be slightly more grumpy, in my experience, than the tusked females. But I'll just keep a closer eye on her. You're an old girl. Hey, big girl. You're beautiful. Your family's beautiful. Hello, big girl. It's okay. We're just sitting. Just sitting. Nicely, big girl. Hey, beautiful. It's all right. So, her body language there was just turning to look at us. She's being protective over the calves. She hasn't relaxed yet. Big girl, we're going, we're going. <laughs> She's given us an unequivocal message there. Let's just stop here. Just in her body language. We'll just stop and let them relax a little bit. Now, Michelle Weatherburn, you were wondering about how you can tell the age of an elephant. And the answer is... You can't really, you definitely can't do it by looking at the size of their tusks because of course as we've got a clear example, you've got an elephant without any at all which is a naturally occurring thing in elephant populations out here. About 4% of elephants are born without tusks. What you need to look at is the indentations around their temporal region that where they become sunken. So basically like all mammals when they get older, they lose that subcutaneous layer of fat, and their skin also loses a bit of elasticity. It's okay, big girl. I know you're upset. It's all right. We're sitting far away. It's fine. I'm just talking to her. Obviously, she doesn't understand a word I'm saying, but they do understand tone, and they therefore understand intention through that. As I said, she's an old girl. Who knows what memories she has stored back there. I'm also always a bit more careful, not a bit more careful, I'm always careful around elephants, but a bit more aware of their body language, especially when they've come from the Kruger National Park. They're just unfamiliar with these areas. And that part of Kruger that they've just come in from, they may not have seen cars for years, potentially. It's a part of the Kruger National Park that has hardly any roads on it. So the younger females are fine. It's just our bigger and older, older girl. Now this little calf with a stick in his mouth. So cute. Uh, he's probably, he or she, I can't tell at this distance, is probably only in the region of about a year and a half maybe. And that you can tell with baby elephants just because they grow relatively consistently. And they only start to get their tusks at around three <laughs> what, what are you going to do with that, hmm? You see it exploring with its little trunk. What I also did there, one of the reasons why I backed away was because if I hadn't, our only escape route would have been forward through the rest of the herd, which obviously I don't want to do. So it's important to respect these animals constantly, to speak their language, and to remember that we are in their home and not the other way around. And that anything that they do is because we're in their space. And that's important to remember. Hey, big girl. So she's not behaving aggressively, but she was just sending us an unequivocal message to go backwards. And she's going to stand there like a sentry as one of the oldest females in the group. She's going to stand there between us and the rest of the herd until the rest of the herd has gone past. That's her job. And she's also quite occupied by that branch of the weeping wattle that she's currently debarking. As the rest of the herd crosses the road in front of us, and I'm sure they're heading to Cheetah Plains Pan, so we will be able to catch up with them there. Oh, 
And here come the little nonsenses. The bulls at the back. <laughs> the teenage males. Always full of mischief and fun. Hello, boys. Oh. Could you hear that at all? You could. That deep rumble. Now, don't, don't you come cause nonsense with me, because then she's going to come and try and sort it out. And I'd rather we avoided that, mister. Yes, you're very naughty. You're very scary. Yes, very intimidating. Teenage boy. Hello, boy. Don't you be full of nonsense. Very big and scary, but you've got a very big female who's keeping an eye on you. So the young males, when they do that, they are being naughty. That's to learn their boundaries and to be intimidating. Hello. Yes, I'm not doing anything to you. Yes, you're going to be very scary one day, but you're not right now, I'm afraid to say. little bit of displacement behavior there. Pretending to feed. He's going to come charge us again. Look how he's using the bushes to hide himself. Mister, I'd prefer you didn't draw attention to me. Yes, you are very brave. Very brave. I'm very scared. Are you scared, Dave? It's pretty terrifying. <laughs> yes, little boy. Go on, go join the rest of your family and stop causing nonsense, because I don't want your big mom to come and sort me out. Still displacement behavior. He's going to pretend to feed, but not actually bother with it. Oh, trunk full of leaves. Yes, throw it all over you. Yes, very scary. And he's going to come back around this side. Stop it now. This isn't funny. Don't be naughty. Go away. Go back to your, go back to your family. The naughty. The naughty boy. Full of nonsense. And while we await the big bulls that will accompany the rest of the herd, there's another herd on its way towards us. But while we wait for them, let's go back to Steph in a spectacular view. You just came back for us to count the last seconds of the sun going down behind the tree there. You can see that globe just going down. I predict in the next five counts it's going to be gone. There you go. Oh, it is spectacular. Blood, blood red sunset. There you go, all gone. There's a picture for your... I know James would be very proud of me for my shot composition here, and Gert as well. He loves taking sunset pictures. Here's one for your diary entry for today. Absolutely fantastic. An end to a beautiful day here on Juma Private Game Reserve. Must be honest, it's been quite a nice afternoon. Still, one of those days where the cats here are just absolutely a puzzle. Now, very fresh tracks of a lioness coming across Buffleshook Dam Wall. Coming into this area, obviously it's this lioness that's making her way back to the cubs. Andrew, who's just been at the den, says to me that the lioness is not there. So, it's, we can't go there. Um, but what I am going to do is circle around the side of this particular drainage line to see if we can't see her coming in. And hopefully that will give us the avenue to go into this den site without, well, without contravening anything at the moment. But anyway, back to Jamie with that elephant. Let's remember, remember things. Hello, gorgeous girls. We've got the rest of the herd moving through. Oh! And a very cheeky little youngster looking down its nose at us. What have you got to say for yourself, little one? Oh, a bit more scary now that Mom's not so close. Off it dashes. Oh, those deep rumbles of the elephants talking to each other. Oh, not another one of you little nonsenses. 
and there's a bigger one behind him that actually is thinking about coming to intimidate us seriously. Yep, here he comes. Mm -mm. Hello, yes, stand shoulder to shoulder, you two. You beautiful. Have a quick dust bath. Okay, same thing, displacement behavior. It's a bit more serious, when it, not serious, but it's a bit more intimidating when it comes from a slightly larger ball. But he's still young, the one on the right. But he's going to be a bit, I think he's going to be a little bit braver than the other two, and he is going to come up to the vehicle. Let's see. All behavior that looks completely normal. It's exactly what an elephant might usually do, except there's a subtle difference in their body language. There's that gentle, not straight on, but that swinging towards us, blowing clouds of dust at himself. He's pretending to be interested in that, but he's looking at us the whole time for a reaction. He's basically showing off. Mm -mm. <laughs> Off. And Finn, who is eight years old, would like to know why do the only the boy elephants act naughty? That's a very, very good question, Finn, because you're actually entirely right. It's very seldom, Finn is 100% right actually, it's very, very seldom that it is a young female calf that comes running up to the vehicle to cry, try and intimidate us. Finn, I don't know why it is, the boy, I think it's because the boy elephants often spend a bit more time on their own and the, because they're going to go on to live their life completely alone or with other boys, they learn, they have to learn to be independent and they have to learn where their boundaries are because they're not, yes, throw your stick, <laughs> they're not always going to have the protection of the herd. So nature has made it so that they are a little bit more adventurous than the females. Yes, very intimidating. Off you go. He's still going to come back. Hmm, or not. Bye-bye then. <laughs> Beautiful elephant sighting. Really, really stunning. It's worth being all the way on the Kruger National Park boundary in a very long way from home just to enjoy a moment like that. And it's really fun to just sit and read their body language and to try and understand what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing. And Finn, and to lots of others, one day when those boys grow up, they are going to be seriously intimidating. They're going to be scary. You can imagine when they're absolutely huge, just how scary it will be to have them coming up to vehicles and trying to scare the people inside them. It's also from the Kruger National Park. They've learned bad habits because, of course, the, the Kruger is open to all manner of guests to come through. Oopsie, sorry, I forgot not to move my hat. Um, and what that means is occasionally they have bad experiences with vehicles or, as is, the, as is what happened here, I think, with the, two, with the boys, they get people that immediately start their cars and drive away and they've learned that, hey, this is fun. I can scare this thing on wheels away from us just have to swing my head and shake my ears and then I'm very scary. I must be big and scary. Now they learn bad habits is essentially what I'm saying. Any more? No. So can I come through here please? And Donna who is watching in Maine, welcome to the Sunset Safari. Very good point. You've said if they're new in from Kruger, how do they know to find water here? It goes back to what we were saying, what Steph was talking about earlier, about how we know some things about animal behavior, but we don't know everything. And there's a lot of communication that happens that I think in the next however many years, we're going to slowly start to understand the way that elephants talk to each other. Now, I don't know that they, they may well they may well have traveled regularly in this area because of course as I said this is an artificial boundary there's nothing to stop them so they might already know that the water's there um, they just sort of come in and drink and then go back again or they might have traveled from far away I believe that elephants have a way of communicating to each other where they are and what they're doing I don't know I don't know 
I mean, nobody really knows. But I think that those low frequency rumbles that travel through the ground and that they pick up through their feet, I think potentially that could play an important role. And also they've got historic memory of a time, perhaps the old female, the matriarch, came here when she was a calf, found water here with the rest of her herd, and now 40 years later as we come, or let's say from the last big drought, let's say from 92, which was the last time it was this dry. And maybe the older elephants remember coming to this area. And yet at the same time, they've forgotten what cars are like, or they've had bad experiences in between then. Elephants are so very complex, it's why I feel you treat them with utmost respect. And I don't know, I've always felt this, James agrees with me, and I'm sure Steph does as well. You know when an elephant's telling you to go away versus when an elephant's coming to stand and loom over you and be naughty and be scary versus when, it's, when it really is serious, you know exactly what it's telling you. They somehow have a way of communicating it, even at 500 meters, and perhaps it's just because we read, we're constantly reading their body language that we become very familiar with it. I think we could have a stunning scene at Cheetah Plains Pan, just looking at the amount of light that we have. Jeffrey from Durban, as it starts to get dark, you wanted to know about how good an elephant's night vision is and whether or not they will travel back tonight to the Kruger National Park in the dark. Uh, first of all, their, their night vision is fine. It's, um, it's not as good as something like a lion or a leopard, but it is better than ours. For most animals, that is the case. And that's because elephants actually move and feed throughout the night. They don't necessarily just stop and go to sleep. They only really sleep for 20 odd minutes at a time. So they will continue to feed throughout the night. It might be slightly slower, but they will do so. As for whether or not they're going to return to the Kruger, I, don't, I really honestly don't know. I'm not sure. I do know that the situation on our eastern boundary and further east of us, having been through, the, through to the Kruger recently, I know that it is I've never seen the Kruger look like this before. I have never seen so little food for the animals to eat. Uh, perhaps they will decide that the Sabi sand is the place to be. The buffalo came in from Kruger, that I can tell you now, because they're... Oh yes, yay, well done Dave! Well spotted! Don't go, don't go, don't go. Stay there. Here we go, awesome! Sidestripe jackal, an animal that we actually <laughs> very seldom see and have only started seeing more regularly recently. Where did you see the other one, Dave? Just around there. I don't see them anymore. Okay. Perhaps they've just stopped to hide behind a bush. So a pair, apparently, of side-striped jackal. We always get really excited when we see jackal just because they are such a rarity out here. Big yawn. They're starting to get up and mobile for the day and giving us a really nice example of their long limbs. The side stripes in particular are a little bit longer and more, what are the lanky I suppose, they're more lanky than the black backed jackal. Oh, we've got a male marking his territory. And his mate, there she is, there we go, wonderful, we've got a female as well, oh, actually no we don't, that's definitely not a female, interesting, very interesting, nope that's, that's, I don't think that's a female, hard to, actually quite hard to tell. Either way, usually you find them in monogamous pairs. Let's see what this jackal does. Look, licking the urine. Rather than phlegm and grimacing, actually physically licking where the other male urinated.
I want to reposition because I'm worried we will they will get scared. I'm thrilled that we've found some jackal. It's always exciting. There's something so fascinating about these creatures. And it's such a pity that we hardly ever see them. I really wish we could spend more time with them. I really, really do. And unfortunately, if we reposition now, I think we are going to lose them. So the, where's the second one gone? Here we go, she's walking into the open there. Here we go, meeting up together again. Now generally you find them in monogamous pairs, however what does happen um, is that sometimes they form family groups. So their pups from a previous litter will stay with their parents. There we go, marking on top of the previous marking. They're actually beautiful. It's a creature that pretty much throughout South Africa, except in protected areas, is treated treated in as almost vermin, especially in farming communities. It's such a pleasure to see live and unharassed individuals that we get to watch. I hope that as Safari Live continues we get to spend more and more time with these creatures because one of my dreams while I'm here is to be able to show you live jackal pups because jackal pups are just the cutest. Little tiny fluffy bundles. Now I know our lion cubs and our leopard cubs are adorable And Tasha Michelle, very observant, looking at the white tip at the end of the side striped jackal's tail. And he wanted to know whether or not, and here comes the second one actually. Let's try and keep an eye on where they're going. He wants to know if that white tip, which does show up so clearly, is a way of allowing the pups to follow them. And that's a very good explanation. That might be why the tip of the tail is white. Kind of like a follow me sign. It could also be that um, it's there to enhance visual communication. As you know, animals speak through body language, visual cues. And she's disappearing, he's disappearing, waiting for the second jackal to join us. Here we go. Well done, Dave. I can barely see them in the dark. <laughs> Natasha, the other reason is because as I'm sure you're familiar with our different animals, the body language the cues, their visual communication cues are communicated by or through <clears throat> the tail, movement of the tail and the ears and the face. Those are the most important parts of the animal. And by highlighting the tail in white, it serves to enhance that. I can't even see which one Dave is looking at or where it is. Well done, Dave. <laughs> awesome what this camera can accomplish because I can't even see that log that it just walked in front of. Sure. Hmm. Amazing. Nope. I can't I can't see them with my naked eye. Unless I'm looking in completely the wrong place. The white tail, kind of like the black tail on a lioness and the black and back of her ears, similar to the white end of the tail on a leopard. All combination of, yes, helping the pups to follow, but also to emphasize the body parts that are most important in terms of visual cues. I have no idea where they disappeared to. It's incredible. The camera is able to enhance what you are seeing on your screen 
but with the naked eye it becomes it's much much darker than it seemed I've definitely lost them oh there they are I've got them again let's try and get another view because I know we don't see them often uh, Aaron Hallis on the subject of our jackal and their lineage they are quite they're very closely related to the Ethiopian wolf in that they are true canids as is the Ethiopian wolf they're actually very very closely related to our domestic dogs gen uh, genetically apparently on the side we've got the side striped and the black backed in this area we also get in Africa we get the golden jackal we don't get them here, it's up further to the north. We'll get them again in a moment. Hi guys. No, they're a little bit skittish. Dashing off back into the safety of cover. Okay, I don't want to interfere with their evening plans too much. And they're obviously a little bit scared of the vehicle to be too close. I think for now we'll let them move off and we'll slowly start the process of getting them more used to people. Alright, we're going to carry on, see if our elephants decide to pop out of the cheetah plains pan. While we do, let's go back across to Steph and find out. Never mind, we're not going back to Steph at all. We're going to carry, you're going to carry on the back of the vehicle with us. <laughs> ah, live filming. It is what it is. Okay. Sorry guys, I would like to stay with those jackal for longer, but I can I can see that they're a bit nervous around our vehicle and I don't want to stress them out any more than necessary. Or at all, ideally. Well, going back to the evolutionary relationship with jackal the canids there's also a lot of vultures here I'm seeing we'll keep an eye on that perhaps there's something that we missed somewhere here uh, the canids are all very very closely related and that includes our domestic dogs so yes absolutely the jackal uh, they're closely related to coyotes believe it or not and foxes there's very surprising, even less than the Felid family, there's a surprising lack of genetic variation within the different members of the Canid family. There's quite a, quite a striking silhouette that this vulture provides. Where have you lot come from? Did we miss something? They are in their own way. That one really looks like a vulture out of the jungle book. And <laughs> just that patch of feathers on the top of its head. Well done, Dave. Now it's an animal that we started off our sunset safari talking about, so in a way it is only fitting that we continue or come to the end, almost end, of our sunset safari once again, chatting a bit about vultures. Tony S, they're very, very important to the ecosystem. And one of the big reasons is because, of course, they, they're basically the dustbins of the bush, along with the hyena. They clean up carcasses, and we saw how fast they managed to clean up that nyar. Just grey shapes coming out of the darkness. That's beautiful. Sorry, Tony. Got distracted. Let me finish off quickly answering your question, and then we'll go and we'll have a close, slightly closer look at these Ellies. Tony, they're essential because they clear up carcasses, in other words, so that disease cannot spread. There's also an interesting correlation between 
hyena population in certain areas and birds of prey, because a lot of birds of prey, especially vultures, And that's one of the reasons put forward as a reason for a decline in vultures. Not just that they're being poached or poisoned, but also that they are cool is that. This is going to be our uh, it's just they've arrived just that little bit too late. It's so dark now. But we're gonna do our utmost to get you some really amazing views here. Hopefully they don't come and cause nonsense in the dark. Luckily we've got a big open area. I'm just going to pull off here and let's see what our view is like. They're all coming running in, there's dust everywhere. It's just that little bit too dark. Oh well, Dave and I enjoy the atmosphere. Unfortunately, it's a bit too dark for you. Oh wow, it's beautiful. Unfortunately, it is coming across a bit too dark on your screen. So while Dave and I enjoy this, I'm going to send you back across to Steph and find out how his evening is going. Nothing quite as dramatic as a massive. We are still circling this area aimlessly looking for any hairy cat and we actually had some fresh tracks of a lioness going towards the den site but with the sun going down the way it is we don't spotlight on those cubs so unfortunately too late she cried was, uh, was, what, it, was what it was. We'll go back there in the morning again and going to go and have another check over there and see what's happening to that lioness. Although I must be honest, it's getting to the point where I'm expecting that lioness to start thinking about moving her cubs. They're only when the cubs are that age, they only stick around for a little bit. And with all that elephant activity that's happening around that particular den, there's a good chance that that lioness starts to think about moving her cubs to a different place. Oh, it's just such a fantastic afternoon. Got some birds making a noise, sunset, stars are starting to come out. I'm hoping that those lions that were roaring a little bit earlier today, this morning, they put on a bit of a show and come out from wherever they've been hiding. Lioness's tracks came straight from this area here, almost directly from where we were hearing them roaring this morning, so they're not too far away. I think what I'm going to do is just before the end of the drive tonight, see if I can get to that Nyala carcass. Lions are actually quite observant to vulture activity. Quite often you'll see them following up on vulture activity, coming in to kills. Tentatively, I must be honest, it looks like they're stepping on glass when they do come in, but they come in nevertheless. Obviously, lions being big and bulky and they're not lazy but they definitely like to conserve whatever energy they can whenever they can. And quite often they come in to try and steal kills or steal kills from vultures and investigate. So let's go and have a look over there see what we can find. We're on in Vubu Road at the moment close to the camp. It was the last place that we have it, had any tracks of Sindile and Mvula but with the distances that Mvula walks I very much doubt that he's even in the same time zone at the moment. Let's have a look in the thick bush here. Hold on. I just feel like breathing out on a day like this to be quite honest with you. It's just a lovely sort of afternoon 
feel here. Been an interesting day having the scientist from. Whoa. Hold on. Camera's shaking itself loose, don't worry. It wasn't me falling off of the planet. It was just me hitting a particularly eroded spot a little bit too vigorously. Sorry there, Gerd. Sorry everybody that had that lurch in their world. Big wallow here. Such a lovely color. Let's see if we can get you into an area where we can actually show you the color of this particular sky. Got this lovely peachy color that's coming out. There we go. I think that's probably about the best that we're going to get it for you. Have a look. It's lovely, hey? Look at all those color grades that you've got there. You've got from yellow down in the bottom right hand corner through. The reds and there's almost like a bluish purplish tinge I would say right at the top in the end more blue than purple I'd think star coming on the right coming back down there wow there's a pretty sky quite burnt it's obviously the dust in the atmosphere that's giving it that burnt color I think that's lovely. All right. <laughs> right. We're going to be sending you over to Jamie so that she can say goodbye and then you will see us just before the end of the show. And we are ending off our sunset safari with this beautiful atmosphere that we're currently experiencing. Now unfortunately I have lost all communications with Final Control. They just stopped working. We've got a really truly stunning view here on the Cheetah Plains clearing. I'm just accompanied to the soft slurping sounds of elephants having a drink. Got a message from Brian Joubert. He says, can you hear the music? <laughs> we have a message from our wonderful cameraman, Brian Joubert, who has said that, can we hear the music? It's the weekend. I wish I could imitate the way that Brian says it. It's the weekend. It's the weekend. There we go. Well done, Dave. <laughs> we miss you, Brian. We'd love to. We're looking forward to seeing you back once again. Okay, well, I'm going to start wending my merry way home because Dave and I have got a long way to go before we get back. So we're going to say farewell to you for now. A big thank you to Dave for all of his fantastic camera work as well as to Stefan Gert in the other vehicle and to Rebecca and Chelsea in final control. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world and we'll catch you tomorrow morning for the Sunrise Safari. Bye-bye, everybody. It is the weekend. Well, Jay, I would have loved to have been part of that little bit of banter. <clears throat> I can't imagine Jamie, as petite as what she is, being able to generate the type of voice that Brian can generate. <laughs> Must have been quite a show. Right. Let us see here. Nothing around this pan. Oh, it's been empty around us today, I must be honest. Now, I'm just busy listening to the radio. You actually caught me a little bit cross-eyed while we were watching that sunset just now. You caught me a little bit cross-eyed while I was concentrating on the, on the radio. Herbert and Andrew 
have just had the vocalizations or just heard the vocalization of a male lion and guess where? Right where we've been looking for him the whole day, somewhere around the Mulwati, Chelepan, Twin Dams area. Can you believe it? A male lion has been from this morning when we heard him roaring to now lying unobserved and not having left a track that I could find. And uh, they're busy trying to follow up now. I haven't found him just yet. Oh, there's a night jar. Let's see if he comes into land. There we go. Uh, that was a night jar. <laughs> I don't know, did you manage to get it a little bit? No, nothing. Just shot out of view before we could get it for you. Sorry about that. A night jar is a type of bird, a nocturnal bird. It sits quite often on the road and uses the sky to silhouette insects above it and then hawks up, catches the insect and then comes down again. Very really swift flying birds. Actually, they're quite agile. They're not swift flying birds. They're quite slow floppy birds, but they can maneuver like a bat. <laughs> talking, talking about Brian, Brian is on leave at the moment and has just asked me to find him a chameleon. Brian, in the four and a half minutes I've got left, I will do my utmost to find you a chameleon to make your leave and sitting on your couch that much better. I hope you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> I think finding a good chameleon is a good idea to be quite honest. So the best places to look for chameleons at this time of the year is in the thicker green bushes. And what I'm looking for is a slight color differentiation to the leaves around it. So you'll notice when I'm looking in the bushes, particularly thorny bushes, for some reason chameleons quite enjoy thornier bushes. And I think it's because it offers them some protection. I don't know from what, because the snakes that feed on chameleons and the birds that feed on chameleons don't really care much for thorns, that's for sure. Alrighty, now we're quite close to where that Nyala carcass was. Let's go and have a look and see what has come up and fed on it. I think in the three minutes that we've got before we have to say goodbye to you, I think we probably will be able to just get there in time. Let's go and see. Can you believe that male lion hat? So it's obviously either stayed very hidden and jumped over the roads, or the more likely of the two things is just my general incompetence. Uh, missed all the signs, tracks and trails that were left by this particular male. And he's lain unmolested for a whole day on Juma with no cameras and cars and clicking photographs bothering him. Bliss for a male lion in the Sabi Sands, I'm sure. All right. Let's see if we can see where this carcass is. See if we can do it in the two minutes that I have left of the show. Of course, it wouldn't be in an easily seen place. That would be way too easy. No, I think that I can see here. Obviously, either been picked up or is moving away. So either not here or it's already been picked up and carried away which is quite likely considering that we're quite close to the camp and hyenas patrol the camp ceaselessly at the moment we're having an endless war with hyenas in our camp standoff in the courtyard they are enjoying sniffing around for any leavings any pickings that they can get at the moment they are terrorizing the camp with Yeah, 
doesn't look like there's any kill here whatsoever. Alright. And that, I think, is that for this particular show. It gives me a little bit of time just to say thank you once again for your support. Thank you for supporting the product. Thank you for asking your questions and for watching us. Sorry we didn't get the lines today, but we had a very, very nice day, nevertheless, full of different things. And, of course, the banter between myself and Jamie. I just want to say thank you to our team. Thank you to Rebecca. I don't quite know who was on D2 this afternoon. Thank you to Gert. Thank you to Jamie, wherever you are. Have a very, very, very nice day. See you tomorrow. All right.